Chapter 2, Part 2 of Thirty Years a Slave, From Bondage to Freedom, The Institution of Slavery as Seen on the Plantation and in the Home of the Planter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Thirty Years a Slave, From Bondage to Freedom. The Institution of Slavery, as seen on the plantation and in the home of the planter, by Lewis Hughes. Chapter 2, Part 2 My Second Runaway Trip About three months after my first attempt to get away, I thought I would try it again. I went to Memphis and saw a boat at the landing called the John Le Rose, a Cincinnati packet. This boat carried the mail. She had come into port in the morning, and was being unloaded. I went on board in the afternoon, and jumped down into the hull. Boss had been there in the fore part of the afternoon, inquiring for me, but I did not know it then. After I had been in the boat some time, the men commenced loading it. I crept up in the corner and hid myself. At first two or three hundred dry and green hides were thrown in, and these hid me. But later on, two or three tiers of cotton bales were put in the center of the hull, and when the boat started, I got upon the top of these and lay there. I could hear the people talking above me, but it was so dark I could not see anything. It was dark as a dungeon. I had lain there two nights and began to get so weak and faint I could stand it no longer. For some reason, the boat did not start the day I went aboard. Consequently, I had not gotten as far from home as I expected, and my privations had largely been in vain. Despairing and hungry on the third day, I commenced howling and screaming, hoping that someone would hear me and come to my relief, for almost anything else would have been preferable to the privation and hunger from which I was suffering. But I could make no one hear. At least no one paid any attention to my screams, if they did hear. In the evening, however, one of the deckhands came in with a lantern to look around and see everything was all right. I saw the light and followed him out, but I had been out of my hiding only a short time when I was discovered by a man who took me upstairs to the captain. It was an effort for me to walk upstairs, as I was weak and faint, having neither eaten nor drank anything for three days. This boat was crowded with passengers, and it was soon a scene of confusion. I was placed in the pilot's room for safety until we arrived at a small town in Kentucky called Monroe. I was put off here to be kept until the packet came back from Cincinnati. Then I was carried back to Memphis, arriving about one o'clock at night, and, for safekeeping, was put into what was called the calaboose. This was especially for the keeping of slaves who had run away and been caught. Word was sent to boss of my capture, and the next morning Thomas Bland, a fellow servant of mine, was sent to take me home. I cannot tell how I felt, for the only thought that came to me was that I should get killed. The madam met us as we drove into the yard. Ah, she said to me, you put up at the wrong hotel, sir. I was taken to the barn where stocks had been prepared, beside which were a cowhide and a pail of salt water, all prepared for me. It was terrible, but there was no escape. I was fastened in the stocks, my clothing removed, and the whipping began. Boss whipped me a while, then he sat down and read his paper, after which the whipping was resumed. This continued for two hours. Fastened as I was in the stocks, I could only stand and take lash after lash, as long as he desired, the terrible rawhide cutting into my flesh at every stroke. Then he used peach tree switches, which cracked the flesh so the blood oozed out. After this came the paddle, two and a half feet long and three inches wide. Salt and water was at once applied to wash the wounds, and the smarting was maddening. This torture was common among the southern planters. God only knows what I suffered under it all. 
and he alone gave me strength to endure it. I could hardly move after the terrible ordeal was finished, and could scarcely bear my clothes to touch me at first. So sore was my whole body, and it was weeks before I was myself again. Preaching to the Slaves As an offset, probably, to such diabolical cruelties as those which were practiced upon me in common with nearly all the slaves in the cotton region of the South, it was the custom in the section of country where I lived to have the white minister preach to the servants Sunday afternoon, after the morning service for the whites. The white people hired the minister by the year to preach for them at their church. Then he had to preach to each master's slaves in turn. The circuit was made once a month, but there was service of some kind every Sunday. The slaves on some places gathered in the yard, at others in the white folks' schoolhouses, and they all seemed pleased and eager to hear the word of God. It was a strong evidence of their native intelligence and discrimination that they could discern the difference between the truths of the word and the professed practice of those truths by their masters. My boss took pride in having all his slaves look clean and tidy at the Sabbath service. But how would he have liked to have the slaves, with backs lacerated with the lash, appear in those assemblies with their wounds uncovered? The question can never be answered. The master and most of his victims have gone where professions of righteousness will not avail to cover the barbarities practiced here. A FAMILY OF FREE PERSONS SOLD INTO SLAVERY My wife Matilda was born in Fayette County, Kentucky, June 17, 1830. It seems that her mother and her seven children were to have been free according to the old Pennsylvania law. There were two uncles of the family who were also to have been free, but who had been kept over time. So they sued for their freedom and gained it. The lawyers in the case were abolitionists and friends to the slaves, and saw that these men had justice. After they had secured their freedom, they entered suit for my wife's mother, their sister, and her seven children. But as soon as the brothers entered this suit, Robert Logan, who claimed my wife's mother and her children as his slaves, put them into a trader's yard in Lexington, and when he saw that there was a possibility of their being successful in securing their freedom, he put them in jail, to be sold down the river. This was a deliberate attempt to keep them from their rights, for he knew that they were to have been set free many years before, and this fact was known to all the neighborhood. My wife's mother was born free. Her mother, having passed the allotted time under a law, had been free for many years. Yet they kept her children as slaves, in plain violation of law as well as justice. The children of free persons under southern laws were free. This was always admitted. The course of Logan in putting the family in jail for safekeeping until they could be sent to the southern market was a tacit admission that he had no legal hold upon them. Woods and Collins, a couple of nigger traders, were collecting a drove of slaves for Memphis about this time, and when they were ready to start, all the family were sent off with the gang and when they arrived in Memphis, they were put in the trader's yard of Nathan Bedford Forrest. This Forrest afterward became a general in the rebel army, and commanded at the capture of Fort Pillow, and in harmony with the debasing influences of his early business, he was responsible for the fiendish massacre of Negroes after the capture of the fort, an act which will make his name forever infamous. None of this family were sold to the same person except my wife and one sister. All the rest were sold to different persons. The elder daughter was sold seven times in one day. The reason of this was that the parties that bought her, finding that she was not legally a slave, and that they could get no written guarantee that she was, got rid of her as soon as possible. It seems that those who bought the other members of the family were not so particular and were willing to run the risk. They knew that such things, such outrages upon law and justice, were common. Among these was my boss, who bought two of the girls, Matilda and her sister Mary Ellen. Matilda was bought for a cook. Her sister was a present to Mrs. Farrington, 
his wife's sister, to act as her maid and seamstress. Aunt Delia, who had been cook, was given another branch of work to do, and Matilda was installed as cook. I remember well the day she came. The madam greeted her and said, Well, what can you do, girl? Have you ever done any cooking? Where are you from? Matilda was, as I remember her, a sad picture to look at. She had been a slave, it is true, but had seen good days to what the slaves down the river saw. Anyone could see she was almost heartbroken. She never seemed happy. Days grew into weeks and weeks into months, but the same routine of work went on. My Marriage, Birth of Twins Matilda had been there three years when I married her. The boss had always promised that he would give me a nice wedding, and he kept his word. He was very proud and liked praise. The wedding that he gave us was indeed a pleasant one. All the slaves from their neighbor acquaintances were invited. One thing boss did was a credit to him, but it was rare among slaveholders. He had me married by their parish minister. It was a beautiful evening, the 30th of November, 1858, when Matilda and I stood in the parlor of the McGee house and were solemnly made man and wife. Old Master Jack came up from Panola at that time and was there when the ceremony was performed. As he looked through his fingers at us, he was overheard saying, It will ruin them, given weddings, weddings. Things went on as usual after this. The madam grew more irritable and exacting, always finding fault with the servants, whipping them or threatening to do so, upon the slightest provocation, or none at all. There was something in my wife's manner, however, which kept the madam from whipping her, an open or implied threat, perhaps, that such treatment would not be endured without resistance or protest of some kind. This the madam regarded as a great indignity, and she hated my wife for it and at times was ready to crush her, so great was her anger. In a year there were born to us twin babies, and the madam now thought she had my wife tied, as the babies would be a barrier to anything like resistance on her part, and there would be no danger of her running away. She, therefore, thought that she could enjoy without hindrance the privilege of beating the woman of whose womanhood she had theretofore stood somewhat in fear. Madam's Cruelty to My Wife and Children Boss said from the first that I should give my wife assistance, as she needed time to care for the babies. Really, he was not as bad as the madam at heart, for she tried to see how hard she could be on us. She gave me all the extra work to do that she could think of, apparently to keep me from helping my wife in the kitchen. She had all the cooking to do for three heavy meals each day, all the washing and ironing of the finest clothes, besides caring for the babies between times. In the morning she would nurse the babies, then hurry off to the kitchen to get breakfast while they were left in charge of a little girl. Again at noon she repeated her visit to the babies, after cooking the dinner. Then, in the evening, after supper, she would go to nurse them again. After supper was over, dishes all washed and kitchen in order, she would then go to the little ones for the night. One can see that she had very little time with the children. My heart was sore and heavy, for my wife was almost run to death with work. The children grew puny and sickly for want of proper care. The doctor said it was because the milk the mother nursed to them was so heated by her constant and excessive labors as to be unwholesome, and she never had time to cool before ministering to them. So the little things, instead of thriving and developing, as was their right, dwindled toward the inevitable end. Oh, we were wretched. Our hearts ached for a day which we could call our own. My wife was a Christian, and had learned to know the worth of prayer, so would always speak consolingly. God will help us, she said. Let us try and be patient. Our trial went on, until one morning... I heard a great fuss in the house, the madam calling for the yardman to come and tie my wife, as she could not manage her. My wife had always refused to allow the madam to whip her. 
but now, as the babies were here, Mistress thought she would try it once more. Matilda resisted, and Madame called for Boss. In a minute he came, and, grabbing my wife, commenced choking her, saying to her, What do you mean? Is that the way you talk to ladies? My wife had only said to her mistress, You shall not whip me. This made her furious, hence her call for Boss. I was in the dining room and could hear everything. My blood boiled in my veins to see my wife so abused, yet I dare not open my mouth. After the fuss, my wife went straight to the laundry. I followed her there and found her bundling up the baby's clothes, which were washed but not ironed. I knew at a glance that she was going away. Boss had just gone to the city, and I did not know what to say, but I told her to do the best she could. Often when company came and I held the horses or did an errand for them, they would tip me to a quarter or half a dollar. This money I always saved, and so had a little change, which I now gave to Matilda for her use in her effort to get away from her cruel treatment. She started at once for Forrest's trader's yards, with the babies in her arms, and after she got into Memphis she stopped outside the yard to rest. While she was sitting on the curb stone, Forrest came out of the yard by the back gate and saw her. Coming up to her, he said, My God, Matilda, what are you doing here? You have changed so I would not have known you. Why have you come here? Matilda said, I came back here to be sold again. He stepped back and called another nigger trader, Collins by name, from Kentucky. Look here, said Forrest, pointing to my wife. Collins took in the situation at once, and said he would buy her and the children. "'That woman is of a good family,' said he, and was only sold to prevent her from getting her freedom. She was then taken into the yard. "'Oh,' said Forrest, "'I know these McGee's. They are hard colts.' Word was then sent McGee that his cook was in the yard, and had come to be sold. He went in haste to the yard. Collins offered to buy her, but McGee said no man's money could buy that woman and her children. I raised her husband, and I would not separate them. She was brought back, and as they rode along in the rockaway, Boss said, When I am through with you, I guess you won't run away again. As they drove up, I saw the madam go running out to meet them. She shouted to Matilda, Ah, madam, you put up at the wrong hotel. They at once went to the barn where my wife was tied to the joist, and Boss and the madam beat her by turns. After they had finished the whipping, Boss said tauntingly, Now I am buying you and selling you. I want you to know that I never shall sell you while my head and yours is hot. I was trembling from head to foot, for I was powerless to do anything for her. My twin babies lived only six months after that, not having had the care they needed, and which it was impossible for their mother to give them while performing the almost endless labor required of her, under threats of cruel beatings. One day, not long after our babies were buried, the madam followed my wife to the smokehouse and said, I am tempted to take that knife from you, Matilda, and cut you in two. You and old Reuben, one of the slaves, went all around the neighborhood and told the people that I killed your babies and almost whipped you to death. Of course, when the slaves were accused falsely, as in this case, they were not allowed to make any reply. They just had to endure in silence whatever was said. EFFORTS TO LEARN TO READ AND WRITE Thomas, the coachman, and I were fast friends. We used to get together every time we had a chance and talk about freedom. Oh, Tom would say, if I could only write. I remember when Tom first began to take lessons at night from some plasterers, workmen of the neighborhood. They saw that he was so anxious to learn that they promised to teach him every evening if he would slip out to their house. I, too, was eager to learn, to read and write, but did not have the opportunity which Tom had of getting out at night. I had to sleep in the house where the folks were, 
and could not go out without being observed, while Tom had quarters in another part of the establishment, and could slip out unobserved. Tom, however, consoled me by saying that he would teach me as soon as he knew how. So Tom, one night, put a copy of some figures on the side of the barn for me to practice from. I took the chalk and imitated him as near as I could, but my work was poor beside his, as he had been learning for some months and could make the figures quite well and write a little. Still, I kept trying, Tom encouraging me and telling me that I would learn in time. Just keep trying, said he. When this first lesson was over, I forgot to rub out the marks on the barn, and the next morning when old Master Jack, who happened to be at our home just at that time, went out there and saw the copy and my imitation of it, he at once raised great excitement by calling attention to the rude characters and wanting to know who had done that. I was afraid to own that I had done it, but old Master Jack somehow surmised that it was Tom or I, for he said to Boss, Edmund, you must watch those fellows, Lewis and Thomas. If you don't, they will get spoilt, spoilt. They are pretty close to town here, here. Tom and I laughed over this a good deal, and how easily we slipped out of it, but concluded not to stop trying to learn all we could. Tom always said, Lou, I'm going to be a free man yet. Then we will need some education. No, let us never stop trying to learn. Tom was a Virginian, as I was, and was sold from his parents when a mere lad. Boss used to write to his parents, owners, occasionally, that his people might hear from him. The letters were to his mother, but sent in care of the white folks. Tom had progressed very fast in his secret studies, and could write enough to frame a letter. It seems it had been over a year since Boss had written for him, but nothing was said until one morning I heard Boss telling Tom to come to the barn to be whipped. He showed Tom three letters which he had written to his mother, and this so startled him that he said nothing. I listened breathlessly to each word Boss said. "'Where did you learn to write?' asked he. "'And when did you learn? How long have you been writing to your mother?' At that moment he produced the three letters which Tom had written. Boss, it seems, had mistrusted something, and spoke to the postmaster, telling him to stop any letters which Tom might mail for Virginia to his mother. The postmaster did as directed, for slaves had no rights which postmasters were bound to respect. Hence, the letters fell into the master's hands instead of going to their destination. Tom, not hearing from his first letter, wrote a second, then a third, never dreaming that they had been intercepted. Boss raged, and Tom was severely whipped. After this, nothing Tom did pleased any of the family. It was a continual pick on him. Everything was wrong with both of us, for they were equally hard on me. They mistrusted, I think, that I could write. Yet I could not find out just what they did think. Tom strikes for liberty and gains it. Tom stayed only a few weeks after this. He said to me one morning, Lou, I am going away. If I can get a boat tonight that is starting off, why, I am gone from this place. I was sad to see him go, for he was like a brother to me. He was my companion and friend. He went, and was just in time to catch the boat at the Memphis dock. He succeeded in getting on, and made an application to the captain to work on the boat. The captain did not hesitate to employ him, as it was common for slaves to be permitted to hire themselves out for wages which they were required to return, in whole or in part, to their masters. Of course, all such slaves carried a written pass to this effect. Tom was shrewd, and having learned to write fairly well, he wrote himself a pass, which was of the usual kind, stating his name, to whom he belonged, and that he was privileged to hire himself out wherever he could coming and going as he pleased. Where the slave was an exceptional one, and where the owner had only two or three slaves, a pass would readily be given to hire himself out, or hire his own time, as it was generally called, he being required to turn over to his master a certain amount of his earnings, 
each month or week, and to make a report to his master of his whereabouts and receipts. Sometimes the slave would be required to turn in to his master a certain sum, as, for instance, fifty or one hundred dollars a year, and he would have to earn that before he could use any of his earnings for himself. If he was a mechanic, he would have little trouble in doing this, as the wages of such were often quite liberal. This kind of pass was rarely, if ever, given by the planters having large numbers of slaves. Another kind of pass read something like this. Pass my boy or my girl, as the case might be, the name being attached. These were only given to permit the slave to go from the farm of his own master to that of another. Some men had wives or children belonging on neighboring farms and would be given passes to visit them. Without such a pass, they were liable to be stopped and turned back to their homes. There was, however, a good deal of visiting without passes, but it was against the general rule which required them. And any slave leaving home without a pass was liable to punishment if discovered. On our plantation, passes were never given, but the slaves did visit in the neighborhood, notwithstanding, and would sometimes slip into town at night. Tom had in this way seen the pass of a neighboring slave to hire out, and it was from this he learned the form from which he wrote his, and which opened his way to freedom. Upon reading Tom's pass, the captain did not hesitate, but hired him at once, and Tom worked his way to New Orleans, to which city the boat was bound. In the meantime, Boss took me and we drove to numerous stations, where he telegraphed ahead for his runaway boy Tom. But Tom reached New Orleans without hindrance, and there fell in with the steward of a Boston steamer, and, getting aboard of it, was soon on the ocean, on his way to that city where were so many friends of the slave. Arriving there, he made his way to Canada, which was, for so many generations, the only land of freedom attainable to American slaves. News of Tom's Reaching Canada now that Tom was gone, excitement prevailed at the house among the white folks. Nothing had been heard of him or the method of his escape. All the servants expected that he would be caught, and I was alarmed every time Boss came from the city, fearing that he had news that Tom was caught. He had been gone about six months when, one morning, I went to the post office and brought back a letter. It seemed to me that I felt that it contained something unusual but I did not know what it was. It proved to be a letter from Tom to Boss. They did not intend that the servants should know it was from Tom, but one of the housemaids heard them reading it, and came out and told us. She whispered, Tom is free. He has gone to Canada. Boss read it in the letter Lou brought. This news cheered me, and made me eager to get away, but I never heard from him any more until after the rebellion. Tom gone made my duties more. I now had to drive the carriage, but Uncle Madison was kept at the barn to do the work there and hitch up the team. I only had to drive when the family went out. McGee expects to capture Tom. In the summer, the McGees made up their minds to go down east and come around by Niagara Falls for this was the place from which Tom had written them. Boss had great confidence in himself and did not doubt his ability to take Tom home with him if he should meet him, even though it should be in Canada. So he took a pair of handcuffs with him as a preparation for the enterprise. His young nephew had been to Niagara Falls and seen and talked with Tom. But Boss said if he had seen him anywhere, he would have laid hands on him at once and taken him home at all hazards. Making Clothes When the family went on this visit down east, I was left in charge of the house, and was expected to keep everything in order, and also to make the winter clothes for the farmhands. The madam and I had cut out these clothes before she left, and it was my principal duty to run the sewing machine in their manufacture. Many whole days I spent in this work, my wife made the buttonholes and sewed on the buttons. I made hundreds of sacks for use in picking cotton. This work was always done in summer. 
When the garments were all finished, they were shipped to the farm at Bolivar, to be ready for the fall and winter wear. In like manner, the clothes for summer use were made in winter. A Superstition It was the custom in those days for slaves to carry voodoo bags. It was handed down from generation to generation, and though it was one of the superstitions of a barbarous ancestry, it was still very generally and tenaciously held to by all classes. I carried a little bag which I got from an old slave who claimed that it had power to prevent anyone who carried it from being whipped. It was made of leather, and contained roots, nuts, pens, and some other things. The claim that it would prevent the folks from whipping me so much, I found, was not sustained by my experience. My whippings came just the same. Many of the servants were thorough believers in it, though, and carried these bags all the time. Memphis and its Commercial Importance The city of Memphis, from its high bluff on the Mississippi, overlooks the surrounding country for a long distance. The muddy waters of the river, when at a low stage, lap the ever-crumbling banks that yearly change, yielding to new deflections of the current. For hundreds of miles below, there is a highly interesting and rarely broken series of forests, cane breaks, and sandbars, covered with masses of willows and poplars, which in the spring, when the floods come down, are overflowed for many miles back. It was found necessary to run embankments practically parallel with the current in order to confine the waters of the river in its channel. Memphis was and is the most important city of Tennessee, indeed the most important between St. Louis and New Orleans, particularly from the commercial point of view. Cotton was the principal product of the territory tributary to it. The street running along the bluff was called Front Row, and was filled with stores and business houses. This street was the principal cotton market, and here the article which in those days was personified as the commercial king was bought and sold, and whence it was shipped or stored, awaiting an advancing price. The completion of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad was a great event in the history of the city. It was termed the marriage of the Mississippi and the Atlantic, and was celebrated with a great popular demonstration people coming from the surrounding country for many miles. Water was brought from the Atlantic Ocean and poured into the river, and water taken from the river and poured into the Atlantic at Charleston. It was anticipated that this railroad connection between the two cities would make of Charleston the great shipping port, and of Memphis the principal cotton market of the southwest. The expectation in neither of these cases has been fully realized. Boss, in common with planters and businessmen throughout that whole region, was greatly excited. I attended him, and thus had the opportunity of witnessing this notable celebration. End of chapter 2, part 2 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista